Mark Andrejewicz is a professor in the School of Media, Film and Journalism at Monash University, where he leads the Automated Society Working Group. He's also a chief investigator with a multi-university RRC Center for Automated Decision-Making and Society. In his research, Mark focuses on the complex, sometimes obvious, but sometimes also hidden interrelations of digital media and automated media technologies and surveillance. In his influential book, some of you uh, know for sure, Automated Media, Mark has suggested a theoretical framework for tracing the trajectory of automated media and their social, political, and cultural consequences. One of his central arguments is that digital monitoring is not only becoming more and more pervasive, but also in combination with algorithmic decision-making and machine learning creates new forms of power and control that then again poses challenges to democratic forms of accountability and also individual autonomy. The spectrum of phenomenon he investigates is wide and multifaceted. It ranges from augmented and virtual reality to online examination systems in Australian higher education, such as universities, to the implementation of facial recognition technology in Australia to identify people. And he's always interested in the relation between the use of such media and the, me the resulting media patterns and forms of social and political polarization. In his talk today, uh, with the title Granular Biopolitics and the Recession of the Social, Mark will inform us about his research on these topics and particularly about a project intending to further examine the social implications of the deployment of automatic real-time mass identification systems that use facial recognition and other biometric technologies. Building on the literature of biopower, Mark discusses how such biometric systems to identify individuals reconfigure the relationship between individuals and the social systems surrounding them, and how this nurtures implicit and explicit forms of surveillance, governance, and control over individuals. In his conclusion, Mark will show how these developments finally result into a recession of the social. Dear Mark, we are very happy to have you here. Again, a warm welcome from me, the whole Semki team, and all the people in the audience. We are very excited about your ideas that will bridge many of the ideas we talked about yesterday, I think, and are now looking forward to hearing and later discussing them with you. Thank you so much for that very comprehensive introduction. Thanks, Stephanie. Uh, I, I would also like to thank Andreas Hebb for the invitation uh, and the organization for supporting my visit and also Life Cramp for amazing organizational uh, skills. Thank you, Liv. Um, I, the presentation that I'm going to give today comes out of work that I do on surveillance cultures. And so in a sense, the question is, what's the relationship between surveillance cultures and media and communication. And I'm gonna to try to make the case that there is an important connection, particularly in the moment that we're thinking about now with uh, generative AI and artificial intelligence. Uh, so I'm gonna to try to make the connection between surveillance and uh, forms of automated media and uh, perhaps automated communication, although I'm not quite sure if I'm there. Um, I do want to uh, uh, thank Elena Esposito for uh, a really fascinating uh, and thought-provoking uh, and brilliant presentation yesterday. And um, you know, one of the ways that I was thinking about how my keynote connects with what she did uh, was she she raised that question of um, 
what should we be worried about? And uh, I feel a little bit self-conscious in starting off by saying what we should be worried about, but not fully self-conscious, um, because there are many things that we could be excited about uh, and we could focus on that positive side. Um, I think a lot of people are already doing that. Uh, many people are also focusing on the side of concern. And uh, I also agree with Elena that uh, in many cases, the cause of concern is perhaps not the one that we really ought to be worried about. Um, so things like uh, artificial intelligence deciding that it wants to take over from humankind, developing a subjectivity and a will and a desire of its own, I find those um, less worrisome as a prospect than some of the things that I'm going to be speaking about today. The, uh, the work that I'm doing specifically comes out of uh, technologies of automated biometric recognition. So in Australia, one of the projects that I've been working on is the use of facial recognition technology. And what's been interesting to me about the use of this technology is the way in which it enables forms of real-time uh, modulation and individualization of the environment. And I'll say what I mean by that, but uh, it's, it's this notion of the environment or the milieu or you might uh, even use the term atmosphere, um, the way in which that gets changed uh, and individualized and customized based on surveillance technologies that I'm gonna spend some time talking about. The, the last way I just frame the talk, and I'm gonna start with some examples, is to say that the way that I'm gonna formulate what I see as the concerns associated with the recent technological developments is connected to my anxiety that often when we talk about technologies that look to be powerful and transformative, it's very tempting to disembed them from the social contexts in which they develop. So if you look at the history of media technologies, one of the things that you'll see is the same predictions get made over and over again, usually in the realm of electronic media, uh, it's almost the same tech, the same uh, promises and the same anxieties get recapitulated over and over again. And very often they're associated um, with what's considered to be the essence of the technology. This technology is in essence uh, a decentralizing technology or an empowering technology or a distributed technology or a decentralized technology. Often those claims are made without embedding the technology in the social relations uh, uh, that shape and reproduce them. And my whole approach to thinking about technology is really to ask the question, what happens when it's embedded in the current familiar set of social relations? And uh, one thing that I think about when I look at what's going to happen with generative AI, artificial intelligence, uh, some of these technologies, is to ask the question, in the abstract, they look very interesting, very disruptive, very powerful. What happens when they get folded into the existing context in which they're being developed? And we, we know some of the, I, I, this isn't to say that their uses are fully determined by those relations, but they are often very strongly shaped by them. And one thing that we can know pretty much for sure is that the development of this technology, because it's a relatively expensive one, uh, is gonna be shaped by those players who have the uh, economic incentives and the economic resources to develop it. So the question then becomes, what happens when this technology meets the current um, information environment, which I would characterize as one that's shaped by the surveillance economy? So that's why I start with some examples of surveillance. Uh, and I'm going to try to unpack some of these terms, granular biopolitics, what does it mean, the recession of the social. This second one is, is maybe the most provocative one. Uh, so I'll spend some time unfolding those. But I'm going to start with a few examples of the deployment of face recognition technology for the purposes of what I'm thinking of as the modulation of the environment or the atmosphere that we move through. Uh, so. Um, the, uh, uh, yes, sorry, before the examples, I, I did want to say a little bit to make the connection between surveillance and communication, a little bit about what it means to uh, engage in forms of interaction or communication with uh, messaging that's in a sense thoughtless. There isn't a thought 
behind it. Uh, and of course, when we think about communication, we always project some type of thought or some type of intention, um, some source of significance uh, to the origin. Uh, but I was thinking of, uh, you know, if, if we accept the premise, um, we may not, but if you accept the premise that something like uh, ChatGBT is fundamentally thoughtless, there's not a thought behind it. There is a history of engaging with forms of media that also don't necessarily have a thought behind it. And I was trying to think of some examples, um, and, but, but you'll see a thought kind of creeps back in. The, the top example, uh, haruspicy, is the word for reading the entrails of animals in order to learn predictions of the future, right? And this is a, that's a um, sheep's liver <laughs> uh, that's, that has some interpretive text on it. Um, but the notion that uh, here's something that's gonna give us information, it's not clear where we're attributing the, um, the original message from. Where is it coming from? From God, from fate, from uh, somehow a world which is manifesting itself to us. Um, another example that I thought was kind of an interesting one is uh, you know, the surrealist practice of automated writing, where it's meant to not be driven by your conscious thoughts. But of course, the claim is that what it reveals is a kind of unconscious um, set of messages. Uh, and it's been tempting in some ways, and you've probably seen some of these formulations, to treat ChatGPT as, uh, as in some sense a, a collective unconscious. Some, you know, the messages that emanate from it are extracted from all of the data that's been collected about us and distilled. Uh, and in some sense, it's reflecting things that we may not know or think about our, ourselves. Uh, you know, people made claims to this effect um, with respect to Kevin Roos, the journalist's uh, interaction with, uh, with Sydney, the uh, um, open AI product. Um, uh, and the way that it manifested its love for him, it started to feel like it was really getting at some kind of subconscious desires uh, uh, revealed and so on. Um, the, the last category is what I think might be the most interesting one to think about when it comes to chat GPT uh, or artificially generated text or artificial intelligence. Uh, this term logistical media is one developed by the communication theorist John Doran Peters uh, and, you know, it's very deeply in indebted to uh, the German media theory of figures like um, uh, Kittler, Friedrich Kittler, uh, also Marshall McLuhan. What he's interested in it is the way in which um, media technologies, and here the question of where the thought comes from, I'll, I'll postpone for a second, but media technologies can be used to organize people in space and time. And he's thinking of media like calendars, watches, um, uh, media that we may not think of fully in terms of content, but we think of the way in which they organize uh, our, our relations to each other. You know, the, uh, the clock comes along and makes it possible to coordinate different types of activity from transportation to labor and so on. So they have a kind of organizational character to them. Uh, and one of the suggestions that I'm going to put out there is we might think about um, artificial intelligence or artificially generated uh, messaging as having a logistical um, component to them. The, uh, this harkens back to McLuhan's observation that um, any media, the consequences of any medium, if you uh, have encountered the medium as the message, for McLuhan, the consequences of the medium aren't necessarily fully exhausted by or uh, the content. Uh, but have to do with the, the, the way he puts it, the change of scale or pace or pattern that it introduces into human affairs. And so I'm interested in that notion of thinking about automated forms of communication or automated forms of media, distinct categories. Um, uh, it's probably I'll stick with the media um, for the way in which they change the scale or pace or pattern. And that's what I'm going to spend some time thinking about. So... Um, if we put if we place this medium uh, uh, in context, the development of artificial intelligence, I think one thing that's important to say is that it's deeply embedded in the surveillance economy. It relies on the surveillance economy. I don't I don't call it surveillance capitalism, although that's a very um, uh, au courant 
fashionable term because I think capitalism is always related to surveillance. I'm not sure there's a distinct category of surveillance capitalism, but so I, I'm more interested in this kind of surveillance economy. It's the surveillance economy that made possible the capture of all this information. It will be the surveillance economy most likely that puts this technology to work. Other, it will be put to work in other realms, but it will also, uh, in areas like search, in areas like social media, we know that the surveillance economy is going to be one of the places that has the resources uh, and the uh, uh, incentive to develop this technology. Um, the examples of surveillance that I'm going to talk about speak to new permutations in the way in which surveillance and control are connected, and that's what I want to spend some time thinking about. They are going to rely increasingly, I would argue, on ever more comprehensive forms of the enclosure and capture of information about us. That, in turn, is going to lead, I argue, to the need to process or make sense of this information. It's too big for us at the human scale to make sense of. Um, and to base decisions uh, and calculations uh, and um, motivations for our action upon systems that remain non-transparent and opaque to us, but that have social consequences. And this is one of the things that I mean by the recession of the social. So to get to, to get to the examples, sorry, it was a lot of kind of context. Uh, uh, I wanted I, I want to run through a few of them pretty quickly to give you a sense of what I'm thinking about. This is in the Detroit Metropolitan Airport. It's a, it's a pretty sophisticated technology to solve a pretty trivial problem. And the problem is uh, if you know if you've been to the airport and you know you know one of these big airports that's got many connecting flights, uh, and you're looking at the board and it's scrolling through and it's difficult to find your flight. And by the time you locate the number, it flips and you've got to wait till it comes around again. Um, the technology here, what it does, it's quite interesting, is that it has directional pixels and it uses, among other things, you can scan your face into a, uh, a, any of a number of kiosks that are around. If your face is in the system, it will retrieve your flight information and it will show you only your flight information on the screen. The directional pixels make it possible for you to see something different from the person next to you. So it figures out where you're located and it sends you your information. It's a very interesting, I, I mean, it's trivial and it's a big, it's a lot of technology to solve a kind of civil, you know, kind of silly problem, but the um, uh, but the technology is really interesting because it imagines the possibility of inhabiting a shared space, and I'll use the term milieu sometimes to talk about space, inhabiting a shared space, but experiencing it uh, in the informational context very differently. Um, so a uh, hundred people, they claim, can all be looking at the board, and they all see different information. Uh, that's a quite, uh, you know, it, it would fit with something like augmented reality, uh, the way in which that's being imagined. Um, to make it work, it has to be able to recognize you. And I'm interested in the fact that it, one of the technologies it uses is facial recognition to be able to recognize you. So to change the physical environment, to cust customize it to you, it needs to be able to see you. Uh, and the biometric technology is the technology that it uses. I love the name parallel. I don't love it. I, I'm, I find it very suggestive, the name parallel reality, because it's going to get to what I um, want to talk about when I talk about the recession of the social. Um, here's another kind of trivial but it's creepy example. Um, I don't know if anybody saw this, but there was a New York City during Christmas season, it's tradition to go see the Rockettes at Radio City Music Hall. Um, and uh, a woman was taking her daughter to go see them with her Girl Scout group. And uh, she got pulled out of the line going into Radio City Music Hall because a face recognition system had detected that she is on a list that Radio City Music Hall of people that Radio City Music Hall did not want coming to their venue. The reason they didn't want her coming is because she's an attorney for a company that's engaged in litigation with the, radio, the company that owns Radio City Music Hall, which is a large kind of concert promoter venue owner that owns several venues across the United States. And they'd created a database of all of the people who were employed by law firms that were engaged in litigation against them, and then used that database to ban them from their venue. Uh, and they detected them, of course, in automated ways. The, I, I think the takeaway here is kind of interesting in a couple of respects. One, how do they get the pictures? 
they just scrape them off of the off of the corporate websites. That's a pretty low resolution picture. To have that actually work to identify somebody and pull them out of a crowd speaks to maybe technological developments in the, in um, the power of these technologies. Uh, the second is the ability of a corporation to create its own database and use it for exclusion purposes, and therefore to change the character of a, of a shared space, in this case, a private space, and at the customized level, figure out who they want in and make it impossible for some to come and possible for others. Um, you may have seen some of the media coverage of this. Uh, the um, Israeli government is using face recognition in Hebron to scan... Uh, folks who are crossing the border to see if they're on uh, a list of concern and to use that to block uh, passage through the border. That's a pretty familiar use of the technology in the sense that border crossing has always had that element of sorting people in order to include some and exclude some. What's uh, suggestive is the way in which that bordering technology becomes generalized to the extent that uh, entities have the ability to create their own databases as Radio City Music Hall did and to include and exclude. And one of the um, uh, aspects of the development of this technology that we need to think about, I would argue, is the increasing proliferation of borders and checkpoints, not necessarily national borders and checkpoints, but all kinds of security borders and checkpoints that are able to use this technology to uh, sort and channel uh, movement through physical space to secure circulation. This is another one that's kind of trivial, but also interesting to me because it speaks to a shift in the way control works. Um, but uh, uh, several elevator companies, uh, and this came out of research that we were doing relating to the pandemic, uh, se uh, several access and security companies, including elevator companies, are developing touchless forms of real-time sorting that use biometric technology. So of course, during the pandemic, there were, uh, well, which still continues, uh, but these companies took their technology and repurposed it for uh, checkpoints and borders at office buildings, public facilities, uh, shopping malls, to be able to detect in real time if people were symptomatic and to link that information with their identification. So uh, in a variety of different international contexts, uh, the use of facial recognition uh, was um, uh, deployed for tailoring, channeling, and securing circulation. This example, it comes from an elevator company that's imagining a shift in the way elevators work. It seems suggestive to me for some reasons that I hope become clear as we go along, <clears throat> because they're imagining a kind of buttonless elevator. The, when you enter an office building or an apartment building, the system recognizes you and knows what floor you are cleared to go to. Uh, and as you go through, it channels you to different eleva uh, uh, elevators based on these turnstiles. And when you get in that elevator, you don't press any buttons, it just takes you to your floor. So in a sense, you lose the ability to control that environment. The environment controls you. Uh, and it's, it's, it's that shift that's interesting to me because it imagines a customizable environment. One, that's, uh, that first is able to recognize you and then is able to deform itself uh, in response to you in order to channel your movement. This would be you know, reminiscent of Deleuze's work on the control society. It would, would connect with this. Um, this last one, I, I think gets us closer to thinking about uh, the media role in this when it comes to uh, information. So uh, again, a pretty trivial example, but it's uh, an interactive system that uses face recognition technology, in this case, not to identify you, but to identify demographic traits, and then to use that to customize the, dis to customize the display information. So again, I don't know what it, what it does. It doesn't have directional pixels, so it's not like Detroit. It's not like people standing next to each other see different things. I don't know how it functions if you have three different people with different demographics, but it'll give you a different, it'll give you a display that changes based on um, what it thinks your demographics are. Uh, that's interesting to me because it connects the physical environment, how that changes with the informational environment. Uh, and it's that question of the modulation of the environment that I wanna spend some time focusing on. And I'm gonna use um, some of the work of Michel Foucault on biopolitics to think about this, because I think that the categories of monitoring and control and governance that he puts forward 
are useful for parsing out some of the changes that are taking place. So I'm gonna to try to you know, lay out a little bit of a framework that's probably familiar to some of you um, with respect to how Foucault thinks about the relationship between disciplinary power and biopolitical power uh, and how they operate in different registers and then say how I think that biometric technologies are reconfiguring those registers. So, um, uh, I'm in part influenced by Charlotte Epstein's observation, which I think is, is right on track. Um, when she's looking at biometric technology, and here what we're thinking about is technology that can recognize you in real time at a distance. Um, so facial recognition, gait recognition, there are some other uh, forms, retina. Um, they claim to be able to use uh, at a distance. Uh, apparently your cardiac signature is unique, and there are some systems that are able to do that. But face recognition is the most prominent because of course there's a, a ready available database of photos of so many of us. Um, so Epstein says, biometrics hits both at once the objectives of discipline and biopower for it features as the ultimate individualizing technology, yet it's also deployed to regulate entire populations. I wanna, I wanna figure out what that means if one looks at how it's possible to regulate a population in a shared space in real time at the individual level. That seems to me to be the interesting uh, um, component of this technology. And I'm gonna try to connect it back to the information space as well. Um, so if, you know, but probably it's, it's a familiar framework. Um, uh, for Foucault, he, he looks at these two registers of governance. One is focused on the individual. So it's the disciplinary uh, form of governing. Uh, and the disciplinary form of governing is, um, probably most famously articulated in uh, Discipline and Punish, where he elaborates on Jeremy Bentham's model of the Panopticon. And he's interested in the ways in which forms of training and drilling focus specifically on the body and body disposition and how to get people to discipline themselves so that they internalize the imperatives of power. Uh, so it, it's quite familiar, we know this logic, right? Uh, it, what's interesting to me is it relies on subjectification. You have to internalize uh, the imperatives of the monitoring apparatus. Um, uh, and so uh, for Foucault, following Bentham, or for Bentham as interpreted by Foucault, um, there's an efficiency to this. The whole point of a structure like the Panopticon is in the technological environment when it was being proposed, by Jeremy Bentham, it was inefficient to monitor everybody all the time. It's too expensive. It requires lots of people. So the what Bentham saw as the revolutionary character of the Panopticon was you don't have to monitor, you don't have to watch them all the time if you can get them to think that they could be being watched at any time. And uh, that very uncertainty is at the heart of panoptic logics. Uh, but what's really at the heart of it is symbolic. Right? There's a symbolic power to the tower in the middle. There's a symbolic power to the sign in the store. I don't know if you have them here, they're all over Australia, that says, smile, you're on camera. There's a symbolic power to the um, cameras in the ceiling of the mall that you're meant to notice. Those aren't supposed to be hidden. You're supposed to see them in order to understand that you could be being watched and to therefore internalize the imperatives. For Foucault, discipline acts on the body. Uh, it's, it's coordinated with specific um, forms when he looks at the school or the prison. It's uh, specific forms of bodily dispositions. Uh, but for our purposes, it's the, it's the logic of internalization that I think is interesting, right? Panopticism fails if the, if the um, monitoring imperatives are not internalized. You know you're being watched, but you misbehave anyway. That's a kind of failure of, of panoptic logic. For Bentham, his hope was that people would become so self-disciplining that you could just get rid of the monitoring apparatus altogether. Um, or not the apparatus, you could get rid of the watcher. So you could just have a tower, but no superintendent inside because the symbolic power of the tower itself would, uh, would serve a disciplinary logic. Biopolitical forms of governance um, operate for Foucault at the level of the population. That means uh, they uh, they take place at a scale that is super individual, which means that you don't know for any given case whether 
how a particular individual is going to be affected, but you know what the overall actuarial calculation is. So if you engage in something like draining the swamps, um, putting in a, a street lamps, et cetera, what you know is that you can drive down crime rates or you can um, drive down rates of morbidity and mortality. You don't know specifically who's going to be affected by them. So events that are what Foucault says, aleatory, chance at the individual level, become regularities at the populational level. Uh, and But what's interesting about the populational level is that you intervene not at the level of the individual, but you intervene at the level of the environment or the milieu. And it, that's what I want to spend some time thinking about, uh, what it means to operate at the level of the milieu. So um, just to summarize that uh, those two ends of the spectrum of the forms of governance that Foucault is talking about, um, uh, <clears throat> Disciplinary power has that element of subjectification, and uh, uh, biopolitical governance uh, has this uh, element of operating um, on, a, on the environment in order to indirectly uh, operate on the individual. I'm going to skip these examples. Sorry. Um, the uh, uh -huh. um, what what I'm interested in. To th when thinking about the milieu is the is the fact that it's shared, that it's collective, uh, and in that sense, it that enables it to operate at the population. And I think this is interesting from the perspective of both shared space, and from the perspective of a shared informational uh, milieu. Um, so, uh, as Foucault puts it in security territory population, the milieu appears as a field of intervention in which instead of affecting individuals as, set, as a set of legal subjects capable of voluntary actions, that would be a more kind of disciplinary approach. Um, uh, sorry, uh, that this would be a sovereignty approach. And instead of infecting the, uh, affecting them as bodies capable of performance, that's the disciplinary approach, one tries to affect precisely a population. I mean, a multiplicity of individuals who are bound to the materiality within which they live. It's that bound to the materiality in which they live, which is interesting to me. And I think is suggestive from the point of view of thinking about what happens to the materiality of that environment when it can be overlaid with informational uh, kind of flexible, malleable informational um, interfaces, or what happens to that environment when it's virtualized, something like the metaverse? Uh, what does it mean to be bound to the materiality in, in which you live? Um, Foucault, in his work on biopolitics, has a little note, which it looks to me like a kind of an extension of the logic of um, uh, milieu modification or uh, biopolitical governance at the level of the population. And uh, it, it, it's in a footnote in which he kind of develops this notion of environmentality. And what I think is interesting about the notion of environmentality is it looks at what he calls a kind of recession from the uh, normative disciplinary system. Uh, and you, we can think why it might be interesting to, to um, find alternative forms of control to normative disciplinary because precisely because it relies on symbol, symbolic power and symbolic power might be under threat or under question. Um, uh, but what if you can control behavior, not by requiring some type of internalization or ideological alignment, uh, but by changing the environment itself? Uh, and this is a, a kind of silly example, but I, I, it seems you know like it catches the attention and it maybe makes the point. And it gets to logics of so-called nudge economics. I don't know if anybody's seen this. Um, I think this was in Sweden. They were trying to figure out how do you get people to take the stairs in the metro instead of taking the escalators? Because it would be energy saving, it would be healthy. One way you could do it is just, you know, put a sign up. You may have seen these signs like take this. It, these are all over my university. Take the stairs. It's good for you. Um, that would be, a, in a sense, a kind of symbolic message that asks you to internalize norms of energy saving and fitness um, with kind of very disciplinary characteristic. Instead, what they did was they equipped um, the stairway, I don't know if anybody's seen the movie Big, it's from a different generation, but uh, it, it has a keyboard, a piano keyboard that you can walk on and you play the keys and it plays music. These stairs are the same. If you walk on them, they play notes and it's a piano keyboard. And so people saw this and they wanted to play the keyboard. So what happened was they had the 60% increase in people taking the stairs because they changed the environment. They didn't have to tell people, um, you know, it's good for you, it's good for the environment. They just changed the physical character of the environment and they changed the behavioral characteristics by changing the, the physical environment. And it's, it's, it's that what I wanna, what I wanna um, say a little bit about. 
What does it mean to govern by changing the environment rather than modulating at, uh, sorry, rather than disciplining at the level of the individual? I'm going to skip this a little because, oops. Um, uh, and I, I, here's, the, here's the kind of big picture claim that I want to um, uh, spend the last few minutes talking about. The big picture claim is that biometric technology combined with uh, automated systems, including artificial intelligence systems, make it possible to have uh, some reconfigured combination of disciplinary and biopolitical power. And the reconfiguration looks like this. Um, uh, the changing of the milieu is no longer necessarily tethered to a shared, to an experience of a shared material space in the sense that it's still tethered to material space, but it's no longer necessarily shared. I might experience the space very differently from somebody else who's in that same space with me. So to operate on the milieu is to operate actually on a customizable environment. Uh, and th this, these are like the examples that we saw of the Detroit airport. So for Foucault, the milieu was shared. The milieu was collective. The milieu was, in a sense, populational. But what if the population could be disaggregated and it's possible to identify individuals and change the physical environment? This is why I think uh, a zombie technology like the metaverse keeps coming back. Well, you know, it keeps failing. Um, Second Life, you know, Zuckerberg's metaverse and precursors. It keeps failing, but there's an interest in bringing it back. Why? I think. One of the reasons is because it makes it possible to envision this form of governance, the ability to modulate a shared environment in ways where it's no longer shared, but is customized and individualized. In the metaverse, I can be in the same room, quote unquote, with others, but experiencing it um, completely different in terms of my affordances and capabilities uh, and the attributes that can be assigned to me versus others. You can imagine a kind of hierarchical class um, metaverse space. Um, uh, at the same time, it also makes it possible to intervene at the level of the individual without the process of subjectification, right? So um, without saying, uh, you know, you have to internalize these imperatives, just changing the individual physical environment to modulate the individual physical disposition uh, and movement and behavior. That seems to me to be the interesting uh, characteristic of what's happening. So I'm going to say a couple of things just about the, uh, the recession of the social. And this is more in the register of a kind of um, provocation to imagine what might take place under the conditions that I'm describing. Here, I'm interested in what might be described as the offloading of the social. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm inspired here by the work of um, a guy named Thomas Haskell, who did a history of the rise of uh, social science in the 19th century. And his claim was that social science came about because of what he calls the recession of causality. What he means by the recession of causality was increasing interdependence, thanks to transport and communication systems, made it much harder to identify direct causes for events that material effect, materially affected the conditions of life in a particular location. Uh, and what social science came to fill the gap, to try to explain how it is that remote events, complex interactions um, could, help ex could help make the link between cause and effect that had become distanced by the characteristics of communication and transportation, right? Um, so I, I, I'm using this term, the recession of sociality, which it, it's certainly a contestable one, to talk about the ways in which the sense-making process that comes from collecting the huge amounts of information that are required uh, to power AI systems, but um, also to engage in the forms of customization that I'm talking about, how those uh, that information process can only be done by automated systems, and that that those uh, information processing systems also result in decisions that shape uh, our uh, our prospects, our social life, uh, our being in the world, and that. Those, in that sense, those decisions are fundamentally social, but they're being offloaded onto systems that are often opaque or transparent, uh, sorry, non-transparent. And in that way, we see a certain type of recession of the social. I don't know if anybody's had a chance to see the selfish ledger, the, the, the uh, leaked Google video. If you haven't, it's worth taking a look at because it imagines it's kind of 
projecting way ahead for something that is not too dissimilar from what's been happening with um, chat GPT and AI systems. What, what they're imagining is that there will be a social ledger that collects all of the information about um, all of us that can be extract and the physical world that can be extracted from interactive systems and then uses that to instill uh, uh, to forward particular imperatives that we program into it. So we want to say we want a more sustainable world. It will figure out based on all the data it has um, and its ability to process it in ways that's unavailable to humans, um, what forms of behavior or activity are optimal. And it will then use nudging technologies to encourage those forms of behavior in ways that are not dissimilar to what I described by um, changing the choice architecture for particular individuals at the individual level to modify their behavior. And in that way, it will optimize society. And eventually, the video imagines that it will know what we want better than we want, because that's how these systems work. And it will become a kind of, uh, uh, it, the, the metaphor here is the selfish gene, right? Uh, the, the notion that um, basically, uh, you know, we're mechanisms to carry genes. The, the model here is we would be mechanisms uh, to kind of implement the imperatives that are envisioned by the machine that would optimize um, the life on the planet for us, presumably. But it's what I'm interested in is the way it offloads the social process of governance onto systems that are opaque and non-transparent and that eventually shape the world in, in which we live. Um, so here's the, the kind of claim that I want to make. If you think about the ways in which the physical milieu can be customized and modified based on uniquely identifying individuals and then modifying space in real time, um, one of the, uh, in the informational space, which I think is connected to the physical space, as I tried to uh, suggest with some of these examples, um, many, of the tech, uh, many of the media artifacts that we are familiar with still retain a kind of shared collective aspect Right, so things like movies, television shows, novels, um, even though media artifacts like ads can be customized and tailored in real time. Okay, thanks. <laughs> um, those uh, haven't yet so far uh, been able to be customized that way. Uh, and the um, uh, I'm I'm uh, I've spoken a little too much, so I'm just going to give a couple of examples. Um, I'm interested in the ways in which things like generative AI, uh, artificial intelligence, envision the possible possibility of disaggregating uh, shared cultural space in real time based on feedback. So uh, I don't know if you've heard of this company, Endel, but it was the first company signed by a major recording label. It's an AI. Um, sorry, it was the first AI signed by a major label. It doesn't create, I, I still don't understand how it works because they signed it to create something like 50 albums. But as a technology, it doesn't create albums. It creates customized soundscapes. Uh, and this is how they put it. Our patented technology creates soundscapes that adapt in real time. It reacts to inputs like time of day, weather, heart rate, and location. So the idea is that everybody would have their own soundscape that would be customized for them. That has a kind of uh, milieu atmospheric effect. This one uh, was very suggestive to me. It was uh, uh, one of the high, one of the executives at um, uh, of OpenAI at the South by Southwest um, Culture Festival in the U.S. Um, and he said, "Imagine you didn't like the ending of Game of Thrones." Uh, Imagine a future in which you could tell your AI to generate a different one. That seems very interesting to me because it imagines the possibility of disaggregating shared cultural experiences in real time based on feedback, which connects, in my mind at least, with this individualized modulation of, um, uh, of the milieu. There's a, there's a physical milieu, but there's also a cultural milieu. What does it mean to intervene or to govern at the level uh, of the cultural milieu? And I, I'll just finish up um, with, uh, uh, I think that what we're looking at, what's envisioned by the possibility of these technologies is a form of governance uh, that's an extension of the logics that we have seen in the surveillance economy, but that pushes them much further because the block was the ability to identify in real time and customize and target in real time, both the informational milieu and the physical milieu. And the two blocks, of course, to that were one, the recognition of individuals in physical space in real time, 
online, it's not hard to do that. Uh, but the second, of course, is the capability to process that information, to modulate those environments um, in real time, not at the population level, but at the individual level. Uh, and that's a form of control, which I think should concern us when it comes to thinking about things like democratic, democratic self-governance, which rely to a large extent on two things, a shared milieu, um, cult, both cultural, not necessarily physical, but certainly cultural, and a recognition of the forms of interdependence uh, that that type of milieu enables. Uh, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you for your time. Sorry, I'll go back to the first slide. Thank you. So we have time for some questions. Anyone? Yes. Niels, please. One second. Thank you. Yeah, Mark, I'm here. Uh, so thank you very much for, for your talk. And as you said, uh, you would look at the more worrying aspects. And Sorry, the which aspects? Yes. On the more worrying yes. aspects. Yeah. And so actually, um, I would like to have like a more positive insight now on on not what we can do with the technology. You mentioned like a more sustainable world, but actually we know that at least in the West, the um, the technology is developed and possessed by by capitalist corporations. So, what could you share your thoughts on how can we get out of this escalating <laughs> uh, mechanism? I. I love the staircase that I always see on my way here. Um, it says liberté, égalité, solidarité. I can't remember what the last one is. And then it says alors, sorry, frater. Uh, it says solidarité instead of fraternité. And, and, and then it says alors, révolution. So, <laughs> um, so I, I, you know, okay, slightly facetious, but I, I think, um, I think one of the things that we really need to do is to rethink the economic model that we've used to support our information environment. I just think it's a bad idea to rely on commercial entities that um, mobilize a surveillance-based economy because it's so intimately tied with control. Things that seem really interesting to me, and I've tried this out on some of my colleagues um, who work more closely to the technical areas of what I'm talking about, but I, I think there's something really interesting going on if you, if you take something like um, chat beach GPT or other large language models um, uh, or or even uh, other foundation models um, they rely really on um, a, a resource which is a shared resource which is a collective resource it's all of our information uh, and the notion that they um, uh, are able to use what I think of as a shared public resource for their private purposes seems like something that should at least allow us to engage in forms of regulation and maybe even more powerfully change a model and say, actually, this, this information that you're all collecting, um, you, can't, you cannot privatize it. It's a public resource. We've all created it. And that means it should be governed in the public interest with public forms of uh, accountability and control. That to me would be a kind of revolutionary move, but it's so, we're so close to it, right? It's, it's, I, I mean, we're not politically close to it, but conceptually we're very close to it, right? It, it's, it's the entire, it, it's, it's the formation of a new commons, right? Um, that's in, in effect, I don't know if, I don't know if it's, it's certainly not the legal or regulatory formation, but it's the conceptual formation, right? This is, I, I think one of the mistakes, um, one of the things that I think is so difficult for the regulatory apparatus to absorb is the fact that the question is an individual privacy, right? I, I, I'm fascinated by the fact that GPT um, hasn't encountered more of pushback against things like, well, this is, you're scraping my data. This is an individual um, violation of, of privacy. And I, I think it hasn't because we don't necessarily experience it the way we would on a social media platform where we go, oh, I'm getting this ad because I looked at this and I can see this quite clear link between my data being used in, uh, to kind of influence me. But in ChatGPT, it's so big that it becomes much harder to grasp, right? Like my data is in there. I know it is. All of my papers, everything that's been publicly uh, out there, everything that I've put on a blog or social, it's there, but I can't see it. 
right? Like uh, there's, and, and in that sense, we've become so accustomed to thinking about how privacy works in an individual mode. And I think privacy is the wrong lens, right? It's a, it's a resource uh, and we've all contributed to it. Uh, and that means I think we should have more control over it. So I don't know, that's, I, 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 yeah, I've got more to say on that, but I, I don't want to talk too long. I have three more questions and maybe we can make three little shorter answers. Okay, sorry. <laughs> no, that's fine. So, um, Christian. Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, and thanks, Mark, for this keynote and kind of taking us out, out into the world, into the material world. I think it was really helpful and to point the finger on, on, on these developments that, and, and what's kind of happening that currently we are in a way kind of building on those infrastructures, the informational data driven layer on top of that, as much as probably kind of in the late 19th century, we have been building the cities that we are now still living in that are very kind of material in the way they they are built and in that way also very stubborn. And now we are building kind of that layer on top of that and maybe we're stuck with that then for quite a while. So it's an important point in time, I guess. That's also what, what, what you were saying. Mm. I was just wondering about your uh, saying that we're losing like those collective um, spaces and the social because i was wondering i mean those spaces have always been un unequal like here in this lecture hall you're on the you have the speaking slot and we're the audience in the in the city there are the the cars for example in in europe and the us and australia that have a lot of space whereas pedestrians and cyclists don't have a lot of space so our shared spaces have always been unequal and have been structured by power economics etc um and I was just kind of getting back to you on, on that. Like, isn't isn't it not a recession of the social, but it's just kind of, uh, yeah, a new reconfiguration. Um, the social has always been unequal and now we're maybe making it more unequal yeah, I, in a way. I, it's, it's a great question. For me, it's not a question of inequality, although I'm worried about that. It's a question of the recognition of the shared character of it. For me, uh, in other words, um, the fact of the inequality has always in some level been the basis of whatever type of political action takes place, right? So if you decide this guy doesn't know what he's talking about, get him off the podium, right? We have, we have a kind of shared context where it's possible for a group of folks to recognize the power imbalance that's structuring the relations uh, and then to act upon it, but it requires a recognition of the shared character of the space, so it, it's uh, so I, I'm I'm less. I mean, I'm obviously interested in equality, but when it comes to that formulation of recession, I'm interested in the recognition of the shared character of it, right? If if that makes sense, um, uh, maybe this is some trivial example, but you know, you could imagine, for example, in the metaverse, the possibility that um, uh, we might exist in completely unequal. Let, let's say we're in a lecture room, um, uh, but um, I don't know, there's some enhanced characteristics of the lecture room that are only available to those people who paid more. But the only people who see that are the people who paid more and the other people don't see it. So in a sense, what's happened is the shared character of the space no longer functions in the same way where it's possible to uh, recognize something social is going on here um, uh, and to to figure out what it might mean to respond to it. What if you can't see that that's taking place? Um, and I, I, so so that might be one way to think about it. Um, I, I mean, the, 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 yeah, yes. Sorry, more to say on that, but I I want to keep it short. Yeah. Thank you for your talk. Um, I would be interested how you think about the the role and relevance of affect driving into these dynamics. I think mm. it's obvious that on the level of the individual, it is a lot about effective control. But now mentioning these bypassing symbolic and ideological dimensions on the collective, I think it is a lot about affect as well. Thus, I would be interested how you theorize, conceptualize that in your understanding of, of these small well, loses of the social. Yes, I, I, I mean, um, affect theory is, is not an area that I work in, but I completely recognize what you're saying. And it seems not coincidental to me that the fascination with affect theory corresponds to this historical moment, precisely because the forms of modulation that are being envisioned take place at, in this case, it would be the kind of supra subjective or maybe infrasubjective level, right? That's 
um, that's the model of these forms of, uh, of uh, that is one of the models of these forms of control. And certainly if you can, uh, you, you know, um, if you think about it in the, in the informational space, so kind of moving from the physical space to the informational space, thinking about the ways in which the customization of messaging in real time um, is enabled by systems, automated systems like ChatGPT, you can imagine the, the process of a, 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 a feedback system that looks at, uh, you know, um, you respond, you're not responding to, to this type of uh, message or image or design, but you are responding to this and it can be reconfigured in real time in response to what you're doing without you either having to internalize or understand how that messaging is working or the system having to understand it. All it needs to do is kind of look for the, for the signals that it gets back in real time. Um, and of course, things, uh, uh, um, I mean, here's where it gets tricky with the affect stuff because all of the biometric um, technologies that I'm looking at also have beyond an identificatory dimension to them, they do have a, a and it's, it, it, the, I'm not sure what the correct language to, to use is, but they use mood, intention, expression. So, you know, the, the ability to, uh, oh, sorry, one minute. So they try to read things that we might associate with affective forms of control and respond in real time. So, so. yeah. Andrea. <laughs> okay. Oh. Uh. Thanks a lot, Mark, uh, for your arguments. I have maybe a little question uh, in the sense of sorting. So how you related your arguments back to the metaverse. And I'm just unsure, well, if just not metaverse two. So these were your arguments on the in inf informational environment or the modulated environment. But as far, at least as I understood the dominant discourse, it was more a discourse about a digital representation of the environment. Uh, and the idea uh, to use that technology is more or less to bring people in, however you want to call it, another third kind of space. Um, so my question, put it as a question, so how you would relate your ideas about this, this informational environment and these arguments about bi biopolitics there, but this discourse about uh, the metaverse as a digital environment representing more or less our physical environment. So the idea, let's say, we don't go to an event, uh, but we experience in a shared way this event um, through an online connection. Yeah, I, I mean, the discourses around the metaverse are really interesting because one thing that I discovered in talking with some folks who are working on Web3 is their idea of the metaverse is completely different from Zuckerberg's idea of the metaverse. And if you talk to some of them, they think it's already happening. <laughs> but um, so let me put it this way. For the purposes of the type of argument that I'm running, I'm really more interested in Zuckerberg's version, which is a commercial platforming of, of a virtual reality experience. Um, and I, I think that element that you're describing is certainly part of the appeal and the promise that somebody like Zuckerberg is mobilizing. So there's there's that discourse of you can meet your friends. Yeah, I mean, I suppose we've all experienced this in some ways when we were doing remote interaction. This Zoom interface is horrible. What if it could be much better and you know we could um, you know feel like we're really interacting in real space and so on. But you know. I, this is the kind of political economic critic in me, you know, to put that in the hands of somebody like Zuckerberg is to really invite what's happening in other areas of that economic model to take place um, in the in the version of the shared space that he's imagining. So, you know, real time forms of customization and targeting and so on. I mean, the question would be, how do you monetize something like the metaverse if you were going to get reductionist? Um, and uh, um you know, we can imagine the ways in which it does two things. It acts as a sensor and a probe uh, uh, and a mechanism then for delivering customized information, which is what how Facebook operates. So, I, I mean, I guess I wouldn't want to downplay what you're saying. I think there's there are real, very interesting, creative uh, possibilities. But I, I, um, probably not a commercial model is the best for making something like that happen. I guess that would be my thought, yeah. Thank you, Mark. And luckily, we now have 20 more minutes to uh, later discuss some more questions in the coffee break. But before we do so, again, a great thank you for you. Too.